This message is dedicated in the memory of those who lost their loved ones at Parkland. Will you stand and join hands with your neighbor? We cannot, Scripture says, weep with those who weep, learn from adversity. And the Lord doesn't want us to change the channel and say, well, it didn't happen here. Florida is far away. Well, at Kapolei Middle School, there was a scare. Same devil. He can go anywhere he chooses to be, except places where we can put up the wall of spiritual protection. Let's pray. Father, we first remember those parents those grandparents, those family members who lost loved ones, the 14 teenagers, the three adults, faculty members. It is incomprehensible, but it reminds us that we war against spiritual enemies that we cannot see, who manifest himself and themselves in lives we cannot sense. But Lord, we have the weapon of prayer. We weaponize in the spirit today and we pray for your comfort and healing to come to all of those families, the students, the faculty, the administration, the community. Wrap your arms around them and pour out your spirit upon them that there can be healing, strength, faith, hope, and resolve that this is not the end of the story. And so as we begin today and we take this moment, as many churches are throughout the country, addressing this area in biblical perspective, Lord, we say in the midst of all things, as we've sung, Jesus, Jesus is your name. And all of us say it in his name, a hearty amen. So be it. Okay, slap your neighbor as you're seated. I want to say, you know, sometimes when we get weather, Pastor Paris and I were talking about this, Sometimes when there's a weather report that there's thunderstorms and rain and a three-day weekend, people don't go to church as if they're going to die. And I want to thank you for being here this morning, you and your children. You model, as Pastor Paris preached last night, you model to your children that God is first and greater than all things. So I commend you here this morning. Now, your brothers and sisters, your cousins, your fathers, your grandfather, all that, huh? tell them, you still got tonight, but next week, that's a special week, okay, because we're going to have the pastor of the Washington Redskins, great church in Washington, D.C. In fact, he's preaching to Derek Carr, Zach Ertz, Roy Halu, Tony Stewart, uh, and a bunch of people as we speak. So I serve with him on our national team. He's going to be here. He's our national leader, and together, ourselves and about eight others cover the all of our Every Nation family of churches in North America, which includes Canada. I know that hurts, but that's okay. We're in John chapter 15, and we're going to talk about going from less to more. I am the vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Jesus talks to his disciples by extension to us before he goes to the cross. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Abide in me, or remain in me, and I in you, for as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. And whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Say much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. But if you abide or remain in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. The discourse of much of the Gospel of John has to do with Jesus' final words to his disciples before he would go to the cross, pay the penalty for our sin, be raised from the dead and ascend back to the Father having accomplished his mission in purchasing our redemption and, our, and becoming our ransom. And what he is telling us here is in all of life to do that which is significant, to have lasting fruit, always live intimately connected to me. Jesus saying, he's giving the picture, I'm the vine, you are the branches. So, we start out this morning, what Jesus is saying is as we live connected to Jesus, we will bear a lot of fruit. 
How many of you want to bear a lot of fruit? Fruit, that means the outcome, the produce of your life in every area, materially, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, relationally. Fruit, results and outcomes. We want positive outcomes and fruit. Isn't that right? And so as we stay connected to Him, Jesus is saying our branches, we are His branches, we will extend, but the amount of fruit we produce will increase. Therefore, the fruit on extended branches will become more accessible to others because the fruit we bear is not just to enjoy for ourselves. We are blessed to be a blessing. Now, I have a picture here of sometimes what people do with fruit. They hoard it. And that's what you get. You get an overflow, <laughs> overflow, but the fruit rots because all we do is we keep it. And Jesus actually says we bear fruit for others to taste of. That's why Scripture says taste and see that the Lord is good. How is that going to happen as the book of Psalms dictates? As people taste of the flavor and the love from our lives, they will be aware of who God is. At our home, people bring us fruit sometimes. We get tangerines, we get, I think it's breadfruit, we get other kinds of things. You'd have to check with my wife. But I appreciate when people share fruit with us, don't you? In Hawaii, it's a beautiful thing, right? We got a lot of Polynesians in our neighborhood, and I find that Samoans share. Thank you, JR. In Hawaii, the beautiful thing is everybody shares. Of course, in Kalihi, as I grew up, I find that because Polynesians believe in sharing, they assume you love to believe in sharing as well. So without you having to initiate sharing, they'll take it from you. <laughs> and I remember my friends would tell me, Norman, here's how you got to, you, you, bro, you Asian, you live in this neighborhood, you got to understand what's yours is mine, what's mine is yours, but what's yours is mine. <laughs> That's actually Bible. It is. It might be a bit of a Samoan version, or the Fijian version, okay? But it is Bible. And the fruit that we bear increases as we share. But we bear fruit as we stay connected to Jesus. Now, as we live connected to Jesus and this increase happens, um, guess what happens? It necessitates another season. So periodically, Jesus is teaching here, God will prune us to increase our fruitfulness because what you have now, as much as you're blessed, God says, you may have much or you may have less, but I never want you to settle. In fact, God wants us to go from less to much to more. That's what he's teaching here. But for that to happen, there must be the allowance of pruning in our lives. That's the hard part. We don't like to be pruned. What is pruning? Pruning is pretty much a cutting away from a plant of dead or sick branches and shrubbery that was once necessary but it's a different season so you have growth but you have unhealthy growth and from the outside to the untrained eye it looks like more is better bigger is better right you know when we plant churches we prune our congregation why do we have five or six sites it's because you will reach and bear more fruit in other communities and other states if we keep transplanting people we love, leaders we need, and give them away so we can reach fruit in other communities and cities. Can I hear an amen? But that means letting go of people. We're going to be planting Pastor Tim Ma in two years in Los Angeles. And everybody loves Tim and Blanca. I don't know about their kids, but they love the parents. <laughs> just joking, just joking. And every time we let go of our kids, it hurts. It hurts. So... You have to let go sometimes, but temporarily what feels like less, if in this transition we will stay connected to Jesus, we won't fear panic or think that God is punishing us. He's just preparing us. He's preparing to take us from less to more. Whereas you've had much, but when you're pruned, much turns to less for a period of time in that gap. If we will stay connected to Jesus we will find he's not punishing us. He's preparing us to take us not only to much, which we used to have, but to more, which we've never had. But that takes trust. That takes faith. My daughter, Naomi, whose husband preached lights out last week to you all, who's now ministering in Oregon, and he'll be back tomorrow. 
chased my daughter around since she was 14, to my horror. And I've told the story before. So they went together, loved Jesus together through high school and college, and Nami went away for school for a period of time. But after she got back, she said, you know, Dad, Billy and I are thinking of getting married two years from now. To which I said, it's too long. I said, you guys should get married next year. She went, whoa, you kicking me out of the house. I mean, she didn't say it that way, but that's kind of what I got. I said, no, it's time. It's time. You know, uh, you guys have been together. You're clear in your life direction. And sometimes you have to step into a new season. And they did. So in July 31st, I believe, of 2005, instead of 2006, they got married. And when she left the house, Naomi, who is the living embodiment of caffeine without coffee, the energy left the house. Now, I love my two other girls, but Naomi was like the life of the party. Okay, to get the, get the understanding of what, what it's like in the Lyle home, Billy is the introvert scholar. He's the tech expert. He's deep, right? He's Native American, Indian, Irish, English, whatever. William Lyle III is his actual name. Don't tell him. He hates being called that. His father, who's back there lurking somewhere, his actual name is William Lyle II. Do tell him. <laughs> Call him by royalty. That's on the birth certificate. But when William Lyle III took my eldest daughter out of the house, stole her, married her, commiserated with her, there was a gap in our home of energy. My wife told me, you're depressed. I said, I'm not depressed. <laughs> Men, when they get depressed, manifest anger. Women become emo. <laughs> we went to Cinnamons, and I ate a lot of pancakes. As I began to pour on the syrup, I realized when you eat comfort food, you are depressed. Pruning. A lot of parents sometimes don't want to let go of their kids. Did you know that? Hello, I know I'm stepping on some toes here. You don't want to let them go. You don't want to let them go to him or to her or to that school, to that coach, to that community. It's hard. But I thought it was easy because it never happened to me before. Found out that was wrong. Well, yesterday, I was watching my grandkids perform athletically. One in soccer, one in basketball. Mike is a basketball aficionado. She's in the Derrick Lowe Clinic. He's in the Derrick Lowe Clinic in 10 minutes. <laughs> he's in the Dennis Agena Clinic too. Okay, I, I don't get that. But anyway, he's, in, he's, a, he's a baller. But we're at Mililani, and that's a sports nutty town. How many of you come from or lived in or came from or want to be in Mililani? <laughs> Boy, I'll tell you, that is, Mililani is insanity. As I was there, my youngest granddaughter, McKenna, was sitting, that's Naomi's daughter, was sitting in the driver's seat. And she is planning to grow up early. This is exactly what she told me just before, she, just before that she cracked that smile. She says, Grandpa, I stay driving. <laughs> I thought to myself, here's what came to my mind. Yeah, you drive away from mommy's house one day with your Billy Lyle. <laughs> and mommy will feel the pain of what I felt. Mommy will eat pancakes and waffles. It's pruning, folks. It is. But when I was at the courts, can I be honest with you? I, I bumped into people I knew. And I had the sense that as I mingled around the courts and even went into the men's arrest room where all the talk was about sports, Sometimes we can have our children in too many leagues and too many clinics where Jesus is bumped out. As I talk to pastors throughout America, remember I help cover pastors in North America in our church family. The biggest concern they have is that what used to be church time is now clinic time and game time and sports time. And as I was at Mililani, don't, I'm not picking on Mililani, it's in Kalihi, Pearl City, everywhere, I thought, if we're not careful, we're going to put our children on the altar 
of athletics or activities and we're going to sacrifice their faith. And as Pastor Paris preached last night, we're going to send a message to the next generation that church is good if it's convenient, but what's most important is that you develop, maximize your potential, whether it's in athletics or arts or education. Allow me to, to appeal to you just for a brief moment. Quite often... As our, par as our kids age, we get them into gymnastics, we get them into music, we get them into swimming, we get them into football, basketball, baseball. Boy, it's getting quiet in here. And because we don't want them to fall behind in skill development and we want them to be in that club team and that team where they give scholarships to Punahou and Iolani or whatever, Kamehameha or prep school, we'll go, okay, they got to be in those clinics. I got to go to work because they hold me accountable. I don't want my, my, my kids to fall behind. So what gets cut out is church. And that's wrong. We're going to pray now and send you home. <laughs> <laughs> because the, that's why churches have multiple services. It's not that we're against sports. As you know, I am a sports nut. I think athletics is a tremendous microcosm of life and, sh and has, you can actually teach scripture to your young people using athletics, to me it's the greatest mirror more than any other venue in life. But it has to be in its right context. And so, I say to people, and I say to other people, I say to other pastors who try to pastor their flocks to the same thing. It's kind of like membership. I have been a member of 24-hour fitness, even before it was called that, for about 30-something years. But I have membership and I go to the gym. That's why I have this massively skinny body. <laughs> Some people exercise to get big. That doesn't work for me, so I created a new trend. I will exercise to stay small. And it's working. People have membership in churches, but they don't go unless it's convenient, unless there's no clinic, no games. My job's not too demanding, and that's the reverse. If you want your children, your grandchildren, you want yourselves to bear much fruit to more fruit, you put God first. And you don't just do it mentally. You actually do it and manifest that. I could tell 24-Hour Fitness, I'm a member, and they could go, we never see you, except when it's, like, convenient. How do you think God thinks when we treat him that way? The child that you're trying to make the golden child by sending him to all those clinics could easily turn an ankle. And then the pain they feel reflects your misstep as a parent. Think about that. Now, when I say that, my children have been in activities. I've been a coach, I've been an educator, I was chaplain for the UH team. We just referenced Coach Jones in the earlier service. Tony's worked with me on this. We both chaplain the UH team when it won. We are sports nuts. Tony and I could replace anybody on ESPN. I would be the live play-by-play. -play. He would be the color commentator. They would have the small Asian man with the big African-American man. And I'm telling you, first take or Stephen A. Smith would have nothing on us. <laughs> Baby, if you could hear us, if he could hear us commentate a game or an event, you would go, you guys should get out of here and make millions of dollars on the circuit. So understand, I'm not, I'm not, be, I'm not one that's bashing sports, but it has to be in its right lane. He was the athletic director and the football coach that threw their bodies at Parkland in front of young people to save their lives. That's sports in its proper perspective. That's the gospel of sacrifice. And I want to say to you parents today, in light of the Parkland parents who lost their children, do not lose your child's soul on the altar of athletics and arts and activities, especially if it could be more about you than it is about them. I used to play in leagues in Kalihi, and I'm telling you, there were some parents on the sideline. I could remember this one. Put my son in! 
Alvin can play. He's better than that Jeopardy guy. We had parents from KPT. We had parents from Kalivat, Kalakaua Housing Area. And you know, what Japanese guy you think they was talking about? <laughs> David Silva's father was my basketball coach. He was a Kali Valley coach. Go Silva! John! A Japanese guy can't shoot! He can't dribble! He can't do nothing! Some of you are like that. <laughs> oh, you may not say it that way because you're not in Kalihi where it's normal. Oh, but you think it. You think evil thoughts, and in heaven, it's on the loudspeaker. <laughs> and I thought about the athletic director, and I thought about the football coach, and folks, I know it's, this is funny, but I've gone through a trail of emotions when that happened. I know what it's like being on a campus. So does Pastor Paris. He coached at Farrington. I went to, I, listen, I wasn't, we both have been educators, school teachers. So is Tony. Tony's coach at Roosevelt. This is real, folks. It's not a game. And I believe sometimes God does things. He allows things I don't understand that I even get angry at him. To get the attention of the parents of our country to say there's a generation you're raising that must be stewarded responsibly and spiritually and then everything else will follow. And my fear as I was at Mililani yesterday, it came upon me with getting it reversed. First, it's my kid. Second, it's my kid's abilities. And if I have time and my work doesn't tax me, we'll be a church. Be careful. That is not sustainable. You say, you're threatening me, Pastor. Yep. <laughs> Actually, it's warning you. Because what Scripture says is there's a removal of fruit and branches. God is very patient. But if we don't get it right because He wants us to get it right forever, sometimes He has to spank us. Because He loves us. And when I say spank us, I mean spank the parent. So when you look at this whole journey... Why the pain of pruning? Because it will produce and increase the fruit of character. Look at this, Romans chapter 5. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but rejoice in our sufferings. The great apostle Paul, who suffered a lot, is writing this, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. What is character? It is, in Scripture, it means the mark of your life. It's who you are. God values who we are more than what we do. We live in a performance culture. I get it. The Grammys, the Academy Awards, everything else. But at the end of the day, when we stand before God on Judgment Day, His reward system will come first out of who we are and then what we do. And so He'll do anything. There are seasons He prunes us back from what used to be acceptable. He takes us to a season of less so He can give us more. And what we do in the season of less in the pruning, some people think God is punishing me. No, God is preparing you. And in preparing you, you trust Him. Some people go, well, it's not working out. God's not there for me. My kid didn't make the team. I didn't get the promotion. See you, God. You suck. We don't say it, but we think it. We just say, oh, Pastor, you know how it is. I'm busy. You're too busy. If God wasn't too busy to give you Jesus on the cross... He wasn't too busy for you. And I believe God is saying to our country right now, the pain of Parkland must point to the glory and the hope of heaven. It must. And every time we go through pruning, God is speaking about a future increase in your life, even though it doesn't feel like it. It's character. And once you have the stellar character and God, you allow God to prune away the excess, He can trust you with more because He always goes from less to more. You may feel like less right now today, like, man, I feel stripped back. What happened to the blessing of God? Listen, 
you're just in a season of pruning. And when God is pruning, He is preparing you for more. When my daughter left our family and married that guy, Billy, they had three more kids. I lost a daughter but gained a son-in-law and three grandchildren. That's more, isn't it? But so often it's so hard to let go. It's so hard to let go. Now, let's bring it all down here this morning. Let's bring it all down here. The key to letting go is staying connected and abiding in Jesus. That's where we get to peace. He's in control. He's in control. First, we have to let him mold who we are. Then he can give us the blessing of what we produce in fruit. Look at all around us, the moral failure of all these gifted people in media, education, business, entertainment, sports, sexual abuse, rapes. I mean, do we... I'm not going to overstate the obvious. These are all very gifted, trusted people. Without character, fruit won't last. But God wants to trust you. He wants to trust you not with a lot, but with a ton. If you let him prune you, watch him move through you. And that's our close. The more we remain connected to him, the more fruit we will bear through him and because of him. And that's the fruit that lasts. That's the fruit that counts. That one day when we stand before God, he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into my reward and my joy and my love. Unspeakable. That's how God thinks. He says, whoever abides, let's revisit the text, whoever abides and remains in me and I am him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. In other words, he's saying, if there's a resistance of the pruning continually, God will prune you from his favor. That's what he's saying. Not from heaven, but from much of the eternal reward that's destined for your life. There's a pruning. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. He's saying, but if you let me take from you the excess of what was necessary and a blessing before, there's a guarantee of answered prayer. Because I know you're surrendered and you're fully trustworthy. Let healthy intimacy take you into your next season. Some of us follow God from afar. God's saying, I want to bring you closer. Some of you are already close and you're connected. God says, allow me to take you through pruning. Seasons change. Did I miss Naomi when she left the house? Absolutely. In fact, just being here with her yesterday evoked all kind of memories. I even haven't talked to my wife, who's in the intercessor team this morning, about that. But when I looked at the three grandchildren, I went, that loss was worth the gain. And by the way, Billy wasn't there, so that was good. <laughs> not, not, not in the way you think, okay? I don't know what, don't, don't be evil now in your thoughts here. But see, you know what I'm saying? I can tell you when Billy first started to chase Naomi when she was 14 and he was 15 or whatever, or she was 13, she might have been 12, I don't know, I forget. I mean, I had visions of me going after him with a hatchet, you know what I'm saying? Toy hatchet, of course, but... You, know what? you scare the guy. It's too, it's too early. Go, go get a life, okay? Go, go chase somebody else's daughter. All these evil thoughts. But then, he came to Jesus. And now, together with Pastor Paris, they run the church. If you told me back then that's what would happen, I would have shot you on sight. But you trust him. I don't know, wherever you are right now, if you remain connected to him, he'll give you a perspective that's unique and helpful to you. On Maui, I was preaching to our Maui church last week, and uh, I learned that you can't talk about against the New England Patriots there. It was a week after the Super Bowl. People were hurting. I don't know. So many ungodly people, non-Eagles fans in the church. So today, I'm going to talk about Nick Foles, not the Eagles. And here's why. Nick Foles... The night before the Super Bowl, and you know he's a strong Christian. The culture on the Eagles team was amazingly full of believers. But I, I don't want to talk about that, but I want to talk about Nick, who was the spiritual leader of the team. 
quarterback. In 2012, he was drafted, and he became the starter, the star. Then he was benched, pruned. Then his pay dropped. He was pruned again. Then he was traded twice. He was pruned again, not wanted. Along with that, his wife, Tori, got sick. A couple diseases, Lyme disease, a serious case of a preceding disease that could have put her life in jeopardy. Pruned again. Came very close to retiring until head coach Doug Peterson of the Eagles, as a rookie head coach, who just eight years from that point prior, was helping out at a high school. He says, Nick, can you come back, disciple and mentor Carson Wentz, our new franchise quarterback? Now, listen, <laughs> isn't Nick doing, wait, 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 wait. That's a bad, I was the guy. You want me to better the guy that took my job. Let's get this straight. I don't think that's what he said, but that's what most people would say. He went back. Carson Wentz grew spiritually, first of all. Carson Wentz was on his way by most NFL experts to become the MVP in the NFL until he got hurt, 14th week. The old washed up prune back Nick Foles had to put on his helmet, get in the game and became the starting quarterback and you know the rest is history. He led the Eagles to the Super Bowl victory but the night before the game he was the interview Okay, and before I show this clip, this is NBC interview, so you may not be able to see it. We're tr trying to do it legally on our website and on our app, on our video cast. The media is wanting sound bites about the game. But something happened when he was pruned back about recalibrating that life's not about the game. It's about things more important. Okay, here's the media, if you've seen the interview. You're holding the mic. Network TV. I could just see them going, yeah, 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 because yeah, some of those media guys sold out their marriages and their character to get up there to have that gig. Quack, quack, quack. Family, marriage, daughter. Oh, my God. What, what, what is this guy saying? Give me the bites that my bosses will reward me for. You know why? He's in the right place. In his head, it's not about the game. It's his marriage. It's his family, it's his daughter, it's life because he's been pruned. He sees the game differently in its proper context and priority. God is first, God is next, and God is even third. He don't want to talk about the game. Oh, just in case you were wondering, here's the picture in the game. Yeah. So when you make a great play, you don't go. <laughs> and you don't start dancing and all that. Right? I won't threaten you with a, a sample. He points. He's not pointing to his dead uncle, okay? He's not pointing to Grandma Tutubushu. <laughs> Some guys are doing that. He's pointing to Jesus. <laughs> Glorified God, he never lost focus. And then this was after the day after, or two days after the Super Bowl. What he was talking about. His wife, Tori, who's healed, his baby girl, okay? He was referring to that, not to Mickey, <laughs> but what's really important. But we also know this, Carson Wentz is studying for the ministry. Here's his dream, he says not to be a quarterback. I wanna be a youth pastor. And you can bet your bottom dollar his heart broke when Parkland broke out. See, he said, I want to be a youth pastor because I want to be able to help young people who don't have the family that I grew up in. His mother and father framed faith into Nick Foles. And because his parents had their priorities right as believers, they raised their son right. Clinics had their place. Tournaments, competitions, leagues had their place. But it never took Jesus' place in his life. 
So when the lights went out and he got pruned back and then the lights got turned on and he was put on the stage, Carson Wentz went, big deal. Let me tell you about my daughter. Let me tell you about the wife I love whose life was in jeopardy. Let me tell you about Carson Wentz who's a far better quarterback than I am. Let me tell you about all of that and God in heaven went, that's my boy. That's my boy. And Tom Brady the GOAT will not catch that touchdown pass. <laughs> Nick Foles becomes the MVP, throws touchdown passes, three of them, catches a touchdown pass, and as I said before, the only Super Bowl quarterback whose ambition was to be a pastor. And you know his heart broke when he looked at what happened in Florida. You know it. And I don't really know once he fulfills this obligation of this final year with the team whether he'll even want to play football anymore. I'm sure he's thinking, Lord, is this the next season? Not football. Is ministry the next season of my life? Is it time for me to go make a bigger difference in kids whose lives I once embodied? And would it be that a football coach and the athletic director throws themselves in front of kids, sports icons, and give their life for the children? That's Jesus, man. That's putting the proper people and priorities in the proper place. Will you do it? See, some of you are looking at me and some of you look mad. I hope it's a good mad. Some of you look sad. Some of you look, yeah. Will you join me and other pastors in every flock in America who is addressing this today? Will you join me in bringing proper order to the universe? God first, always. Seek Him first and all these things will be added unto you. Tuatango Vailoa. You guys know who he is? You see women, even women now, now they're into, it's, it's to a tango. It's like in Japanese, yeah? Tango. Tango Vailoa. Samoan. I prayed to open the Senate session on Monday at the inv invitation of Senator Donna Kim. Went in there, it was all educators. It was full. Every time I go in there, it's full. They say, hey, I don't know what happens. Usually it's empty. It's full today. That's God. Educators. I was an educator. Standing there, there's tension in the room. And I go, okay, God, I need some help here. We're going to pray. We want this to be a meaningful opening in a prayer. I said, uh, one of the greatest joys I've had in my life is being the chaplain for the UH football team. It's a state, right, university. I mentioned that. Serving Coach June Jones, when, uh, who shaped Tua Tango Vailoa. That was my point. How many of you love to, I didn't even have to finish. They just started cheering and everybody. I know nobody, every, not everybody knew football. But because... Tua was the star of the national championship game leading the Alabama Crimson Tide to the national title. Polynesian in Tuscaloosa. That's just, that's just weird. Okay? They clap. I said, folks, you know what the secret was? Tua was a believer, and he prayed between plays. He says, that's what gave me the peace. And, of course, it's all gone viral now. You can pull it up. Google it. There's so much Jesus in there. Base yourself. He gives God the glory. I said, we're going to do that as we open today's Senate session. Well, Tua, when he, I, I watched the interview again last night of the end of that championship game where he, after he throws the incredible touchdown pass, just like June, June sits there, taught him, look the safety off. When you're going back, look the safety off. Keep looking as long as you can because you know where your wide receiver, you've already had eye contact. You don't even look at him because that's what he did. He did a textbook. At the last minute, he turns this way. Well, he's left-handed, I think. And he hits the guy in strike. He gets in front of the microphone, and here's what he says. All glory to God. And he starts preaching about the goodness of the Lord. God knew that. God knew. God knew that Tua would give him glory. So God set a stage for him, and he wants to set a stage for you. Will you, will you 
Take the moments he gives you when he gives you more to give him more glory rather than collect oranges in your car for yourself. That's the American gospel. That's what ticks me off that we think that we can use Jesus just to be successful for ourselves. We are blessed, I will tell you, to be a blessing. Some of you, you're here this morning. You're here this morning. And Jesus is just a concept to you. He wants to have a relationship with you. Knowing him personally by receiving him by faith into your heart is the beginning of the rest of your life. For others of us, we need to let God prune areas in our lives that are painful. That was once wonderful. But now God's saying it's time to move on. Tony Holyfield had to let football be pruned from his life. Thousands of dollars a year. And now he's blessed with more. He's, he's over. He's the only African-American bass player in the country who oversees a large music ministry, I believe. People come to church, they go, who's your music director? And every time, sometimes I'll, well, why don't you guess who's on stage? They think it's him. <laughs> this is Robert Shinoda, star of Hawaii Five-0. Any music scene, Robert's in it. Head of the musicians' union. I go, eh! Check door number two. They go, him? God's got a plan. Often it's very different from ours. Nick Foles, I would gesticulate, I would imagine, looks at the young lives at Parkland, and he's looking at Tori, his wife, and he's going, honey, is it time? It's only money. I mean, what do you do for an encore, people? MVP at the Super Bowl? Throw a pass, catch a pass, beat Tom Brady? If it were me, I'm done. I'm saying, God, unless you want me in the NFL, seminary and youth pastoring, get me there as soon as possible. But I'm not Nick Foles. But I can challenge you. Where would God want to be pruning you so you can go from less to much to more? Father, help us. Father in heaven, help us. We pray for the families in Parkland once again. It is an incomprehensible tragedy. School of 3,000, one of the safest communities in all of our country where parents would get district exceptions to send their kids there. We don't understand it, but we do see it in account after account of hymns of praise being sung, prayer circles breaking out, church services acknowledging you. And we join in concert with them today on this Sunday and we say, oh God, pour out your spirit on that community. Have mercy. Pour out your grace on every family that has lost these people. Help us to take it personally, that we don't just leave this building in our groups thinking, oh, thanks that it didn't happen to me. No, make us difference makers. Salt and light reflecting your glory and bringing hope to people around us so when someone is troubled like the shooter, we can catch them way ahead of time and share with them the love and acceptance of the gospel. This church started with young, troubled young people. This is very real to me and to us. The answer is Jesus. It has always been that. It will always be that. Father, make us reflector of your Son.